This is Starved Storefront. This month is Women's History Month, and we've partnered with Cat Footwear to bring you stories from female entrepreneurs in the construction industry. This is the first episode of our four-part series. The goal is to highlight some of the female movers and shakers in an industry where they make up only around 10% of the workforce. Our guest today is Katie Frank, founder of Emod, a company focused on improving safety on construction sites. Katie's story is a deeply personal one, and she's helping to modernize construction safety so that every worker can go home to their families every night. So listen in as we cover everything from why there's a lack of respect inherent in the construction industry, the importance of keeping your cool in high pressure scenarios, and why easy fixes have high costs. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to the podcast on today's show. We're talking to Katie, founder, CEO of Emod. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Also, Natalia is joining us, which is rare for Welcome back, Natalia. So Natalia is back. As you guys know, we're doing a a whole campaign with Cat Footwear around Do More Her Way. Caitlin's story is quite incredible. So first of all, you both went to school together. Yes. Right. So let's go to to the beginning. So... You're in school. How many women are in your class? You're at Wentworth in Boston. How many women are in the We're class? 19% women yeah. in the entire school. Mm-hmm. In the whole school. Okay. And, so, and this like, isn't just construction. This is like across the board at the, yeah, at the okay. entire school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a fifth. And did you guys see a lot of women switching majors at the beginning? Like, or did 20% of them, 19% of them actually make it to graduation day? Well, do you remember what they said to us? Yes. Look to your left. Look, look to your, your right. right. Yeah. They won't be These, there. They won't be here. And it happened. We dropped by 50%. In the within, but that's you know, male first and semester. female, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was it was like probably eighty percent male in architecture as well. Yeah. And what was your first job out of school? What, what was the right first out thing? of school? I went to work for Commodore Builders, and okay. so I was a as a PM. No, I went. I wanted to go right into the field, so okay. I was an assistant superintendent there, and just dove right in. Assistant yeah. super, female. Yep. Any issues? Oh, day one on the job site, they walk in and. I'm measuring for some opening that we're going to be cutting in a concrete wall. And I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing at this point. But, you know, the superintendent sends me out there and I'm measuring. And this guy walks up to me behind me and he's like, oh, are you the architect? Are you measuring for curtains? I was so insulted. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Just like day one on the job site. You know, I'm nervous enough. And now you're... You're thinking I'm someone else that I'm not. But you were in all your PPE and your Commodore stuff, so I don't... That's crazy. It was just, you know, as soon as they saw a female on the job site, they just made that assumption that Casual either, sexism. Yeah. Wild. So I'm either there with my dad. Typically, that was another question I got asked a lot. Or yeah. I was the what architect. What would they say? Where's your dad? Oh, are you here with your dad today? Like bring your kid to work. <laughs> and I, my response was always, no, are you? Yeah, right. Uh-huh. That's such a good comeback, by the yeah. way. I love that. And then for you... What was your your first my, job? My first job was, so it was kind of quasi in the field, but also semi in the office. So, you know, it was uh, building information modeling. It was the 3D stuff. But a lot of that uh, required me to be on site every week on multiple job sites for meetings with the subs, uh, going through coordination, going through and mapping out problems in the field. And I fell in love with being in the field. I loved, like, actually seeing something that we had put together get built in front of my eyes. And I fell in love with it. And then how long were you in the field before you became a super? Only maybe a year and a half. Which I is think. a fast trajectory. So most for most people, for people listening, it's like APM, PM, assistant super. Yeah. And you can be an assistant super for like five years. Oh, yeah. Easily. Six yeah. years easily. Yeah. For that long and so too. here you are like just crushing the game. I was probably... 23 as a super which is rare i would say most people people listening like it's like 30 becomes it's usually 30. yeah yeah and And you've had to have like three huge projects Mm multi-year projects under your belt and you were always the youngest right and i looked the youngest i had that baby face of you know i probably looked like i was 18. (laughs) that was probably something else you had to overcome then all the ageism as well oh yeah i mean that's kind of where the are you at work with your dad kind of comes yeah always came in that's a good thing though you do look young it's good yeah i mean i'm enjoying it now (laughs) (laughs) What was the decision to start the tech company? And so here you are in a male dominated industry, you're doing really well, you're successful, you're making good money, you're being respected by your peers, and all of a sudden you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start something else. So it started with a few things. When I was a superintendent running work, I grew up around construction and my dad was a general contractor and I always wanted him to come home. And so I saw all these safety things happening on job sites, knowing that like one wrong step someone else making a mistake like that could have been my dad and watching these guys and you know i'd always walk up to them 
is that smart? What are you thinking? Like, let's talk through it. And there was actually this one electrician named Bill. I was building out a yoga studio in San Francisco, and we had to install a step-down transformer for the power. And he said to me, I don't want to do your paperwork. It's just stupid paperwork. You know, it doesn't actually provide anything. It just covers your ass. The safety checklist. The safety checklist. And I looked at him, and I had worked with him for years. And I said, Bill, I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for your daughters because we were at the same age. And I was like, I'm not calling them to tell them you're not coming home today. And so safety in the industry has really turned into checklist and paperwork. And the reality is like these guys, they guys and gals want to just build. They have a passion for building. They want to be in the field. How do we get them back to that faster instead of doing this, you know, CYA checklist type of functionality? Yeah. I'll tell my story. So when I first got into the, I was like a field engineer. And so my first job was the safety checklist. And so it's this, you're in a trailer, there's a bunch of paper, there's a binder, you're in charge of it. So you're three hole punching paper. Like it's like that dumb. And then you go out into the field and you walk around you make some observations and you're looking for things like, are people tying off ladders on scaffolding is another one. Uh, cords, like a lot of, like a lot, you see the, the one you see all the time Open is trenches. a huge, extension cord that's got all this duct tape all over and that's an instant no-no like you should just go buy a new cord because that has the ability to like if if water is pooling it's a like people die and it's a real thing and but it's at the same time it's like left to me right so it's left to the junior person on site that knows nothing and it's the first thing they do in the morning on monday which is usually when the site's the safest Mm -hmm. and it's this thing that it covers your ass that's really it's a cya mechanism And so for me, it was like, how do we get back to safety? How, as a superintendent, can I be proactive with safety instead of reacting to safety issues all the time? And I went out and I looked. For for, for like a solution, a tool. For a solution that would actually, you know, fit what we needed. Like an app or something you can implement. Exactly. It would be easy for the guys. And something that was built for the field, not for, you know, the office, that junior level person, because they're not the ones getting hurt. Like, why wasn't there an app or a platform or something for the electrician, for the person in the field? For the person with the flip phone. Like, yeah. that's the person it's for. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a hard and problem so to solve. One of the things that throughout my career, no matter where I've worked, everyone has had to fill out pre-task plan, JHA, JSA, whatever you want to call it, these hazard assessments. So like, what are you working on today? What are the steps? What are the hazards? And what are your safe plans? People just pencil whip them when they're on paper because they don't know how to fill them out. You know, they don't understand when you say like you're installing glass. One of the ones that I got was install glass. Steps were don't break glass. Hazard was (laughs) gravity. (laughs) And the safe plan was be safe. Signed by six adult men. Oh my God. The hazard was gravity. I I mean, mean, gravity. It's very creative. It's always a hazard. It's kind of funny. It's so funny. It's very creative. The mental gymnastics involved in, in creating that is probably more difficult than actually doing it correctly. Yeah. 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 And so I, of course I had to stop them, get them to revise it and resubmit it. But that piece of paper didn't do anything for them. It gave them everyone a good laugh and that was about it. And so <laughs> Don't break like, glass. <laughs> if someone had gotten hurt as a superintendent, I'm liable. Right. It's on you. It's on me. Yeah. If I'm completely negligent and something really bad happens, I go to jail. The CEO goes to jail. You know, so when you're running work at that capacity and you're thinking about things that way, you're like, I can't just let these things happen. And so you decided to, uh, I guess, embark on building this thing in-house, some mm-hmm. sort of app, nothing's on the market. Yep. And then seeing if these guys would use it. Yep. And what was that like? So we started off with, you know, that one kind of feature of the pre-task plan. We got that built out. And then we thought about, oh, well, there's also, you know, additional site-specific safety plans that need to be built out. How do we tie these together? And then we rolled it out into the field. The first round, it was clunky. You know, it was trying to figure out it's different. It's an industry that doesn't like change. They don't want to adopt new technology. And they pushed through it. But the biggest thing was after the first couple days of using it, they stopped complaining. And so once they got used to it, that's all it was. And if I have my investor hat on, like how big of a problem is this? Like how big of a market? What do people spend on safety every year? So I was on site the other day talking to a mechanical foreman and I asked him, you know, do you know who I am? He's like, no. I was like, what do you use for safety? He says, oh, the contractor requires me to use EMOD. I was like, okay. And I was like, would you ever go back to paper? He says, no. EMOD saves me 55 minutes a day just on the one form. He said if he had to write it out by hand, 
It would have taken him an hour. He said, I can submit it for my entire crew within five minutes. And so that's just a foreman. Yeah. You know, that's just one person saving them. Imagine getting back essentially five hours, if you're working five days a week, five hours in your work day. That's almost another work day you're getting back. Yeah. And if the incident does happen, how much does that cost the company? Like what are the, the potential costs outside of, well, let's include time to like shut down the project, all that. So there's actually an OSHA calculator. So you can go online and you, for example, a sprained wrist. There's the direct cost and indirect cost. And both of them are around 30,000 bucks a piece. And wow. so that's $60,000, meaning you need to do $2.2 million a wrist. more work. And that's one sprained wrist. So think about a laceration someone losing something like you know a much bigger injury and investing into safety just seems like a no-brainer at that point if you can prevent one of those things from happening you've already paid for the software so it starts as liability and i think you touched on something earlier where you were talking with the guys and saying i'm not worried about your safety just for this piece of paper i'm worried about so that your sons and your daughters can have you come home to them and to me that's a that's a big part of the problem with just safety on work sites in general is it's twofold. The first fold is like the people who are actually getting injured may not see it as personal as what you just put it. And they might see it as some, you know, like the company's problem, the supervisor's problem, like not my problem. I'm just here to get the job done. And then the second fold is like, even if they see something unsafe, I feel like OSHA these days is so understaffed that they are not able to go around to all the work sites that they should be going around to. So these holdups in the system just enable more problems to proliferate because they're not being checked on by anyone and any authority. So, I mean, how do you then address that problem on a, a large scale? Because you can't go to everyone and be like, look, I'm, I'm just doing this so that you can go home to your family at the end of the night. I mean, I think a lot of it starts with the lack of respect in the field. And that's, you know, there's a respect at a foreman level. You know, the foreman talk to each other. They're constantly talking with superintendents and project managers. But how often is like a thank you given in the field? You know, I appreciate what you're doing. And I think once that changes in the industry, that like respect for people, and that we actually care what happens to them, and that's communicated down of like why you're implementing a safety program. You know, why are you forcing them to fill out this paperwork or do additional documentation? It's because we care about you. We respect you as a human and we want you to go home safe. I think having those kind of conversations changes the whole atmosphere around safety. And like when a safety officer shows up on a job site, everyone's like running around, grabbing hard hats, trying to make sure everything's perfect. When the reality is like a safety officer should show up and they're there to help. And that's just not how the environment is right now. What has the transition been like from superintendent to then getting this off the ground to now CEO, tech company, hiring people in development, people in marketing, people in sales, right? And running like a whole new operation. I'm definitely, you know, I'm drinking from a fire hose and it, <laughs> I've loved it. And it's almost like being a superintendent all over again. You know, I just need to get the right people in the right seats to do their job. You know, I have a sales guy. He's great. He knows exactly what he needs to be doing. He's my electrician. You know, I have a business operations guy. He knows what he needs to be doing. He's my drywaller. And it's just hitting, I'm here to make sure we hit our milestones and that we're hitting our quarterly goals. It is a different, you know, completely different job. But what's been fun about it is having that like same type of environment to just hit those goals and work through things and having that real life field experience. So when I'm talking to a development team of what's going to work, why simplicity is so important when we're building out an app. Right, because your user is so, yeah. exactly. you know such that a intimately. unique user. Yeah. 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 And so you're like a product market expert in that world. As it relates to like going out in the VC world, what has that been like for you? Is it challenging? Let's see, we're about to enter February, March, March. And so like, this is the time. All the VCs are back in the office. So you're embarking on fundraising. We are. So we are working on fundraising. I have a passion for building. I have a passion for construction. I have a passion for sending these people home safe and just the overall morale of a job site. And so I can talk about myself. I can talk about what EMA does, the problems we're solving and why it's so important that we're doing it. This is a completely different world for me though, talking to VCs and trying to have these conversations where the only budget reports I was reading were my labor and my material reports before. And so I've had to learn a ton um, this year so far. 
But again, I have the right people in the right places to help support me and teach me and help with grow with the company. How many customers do you have right now? So we have just under a thousand companies on the platform and we have 17,000 users. I'm hoping that we jump again. Is yeah. it centered in any one specific area of the country or is it pretty diversified across the whole uh, United States? So we're across the United States. Uh, I'd say most of our users are probably in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. primarily because we dog fooded this for a while. We wanted to make sure it worked before we put it out to market. And we put it out to a bunch of local contractors that we could actually go to the field with and watch them use it so that we could see the feedback instead of, you know, jumping on a Zoom call and them telling us what wasn't working. We saw where they wanted to click. We saw what they were trying to do so that we could make those adjustments quickly. But like in terms of outside of the Bay Area, are you seeing expansion or growth in any one specific market? Or project size, or project, probably. Yeah. Project size, you know, we're targeting or working with mostly, I'd say, contractors between the 50 million to 200 million dollar range who are you know focused on safety may not have the perfect scenario of how they want to roll out a safety program or they're looking for an avenue to execute a safety program through and that's essentially what emod is we have a platform where you can execute your safety program you can show your clients that you have that program so there's a whole reputation side of this like if you want to be known as that safety contractor. Well, here's visibility into everything that I'm doing to make sure that my job sites are safe. And then we actually have an insurance side of it as well so that in, your insurer can see that you're actually doing these things as well. So once you raise the money from the VC firms, what is your plan on where do you want to apply that and where can it best be used? So we really wanna grow our sales team, get that up and running, but also grow our dev team. And some of that is to enhance some of our current features but also make sure that we're constantly going back to our core, built for the field, by the field. Making sure that we simplify things and that our end users are gaining the benefit of it. The data that we collect, that's just an added benefit, really. You know, what we really want to do is make sure that we are focused on the field. What is the data that you're collecting? Like, what, what's the secret sauce that you think you could turn into something later? Like percentages of, of you know, like reports filed on time and that are accurate or... So I think the, our biggest differentiator against anyone else who is out there right now is that, let's say you're an electrician, you show up on a job site and you're installing lights. You can go into the pre-task plan, click on install lights. It's going to say, here are 10 possible steps for your installing lights. And once you click through those, here are your 10 possible hazards and your 10 possible safe plans to go with those hazards. And so we're helping them proactively think about what some of the hazards and some of the steps may be because they don't know what what to fill out on that blank piece of paper. And so because we're contractors at our core, we have that ability to pre-create all of this information for them. And so I see it like that being. And you have to give all the foreman's uh, iPad or are they using their phones? What is the? We see actually 70% of them using their phones. Okay. You know, it is an iOS app, so they can definitely do use it on their iPad as well. And I, I'd say the bigger mechanical drywall MEP subs are probably on iPads, but some of the smaller subs are on their phones. What I love about the industry for people at a high, at a really high level, there's two behemoths in the space, right? You have Autodesk and, and Procore at this stage. And so Procore was supposed to IPO pre-pandemic. I don't know what happened there. But what's happening is you have all these tech companies that can emerge. And as long as they can get market share, these behemoths will buy them for like 20 to 50 X revenue, which is huge. And so it creates sort of this interesting market where it allows tech companies to have lower price offerings so that they can get adoption. And so you're trading adoption for market share. And then you have two players that are at the top just trying to buy market share. And so it's a bit of a shark tank, but it's also very f profitable if you can if you can pull it off in a five to seven year window. Yeah, and then those companies can roll it out in, in an entirely massive And then they know, package it, right? Way. So then they buy it, they package it, and they make it subscription-based, which mm -hmm. helps their, I mean, the earnings Simplifies. go through the roof, yeah. It's, it's simple because they have a customer for 7, 10, 12 years that they can monetize in different ways. And on the insurance side, it, that's so interesting and it just feels like such a natural uh, progression because it is so in line with the way that the insurance industry is going these days. I mean, you know, think about like Progressive and companies like that. I mean, they're installing devices like in your car so that they can give you savings based on real-time feedback. And what you're doing is the same exact thing, essentially, right? I mean, you're giving them data about the companies they're insuring and saying, look how safe these companies are and look, you know, at all this data and that they can give those companies discounts and, you know, yeah. it's in their favor. And I mean, honestly, more than anything, like 
Right now, everything is on paper or multiple apps. That's how most companies are doing it. So having everything in one centralized location and how everything talks to each other, now you can see where you have holes, where you have issues, and actually address them so that when your insurance company does come back around, you can say, I found this. You know, maybe it was hand lacerations were like an issue or injuries were an issue on a certain project or with a certain trade. We did XYZ training to make sure that this doesn't happen again in the future. And so it's giving you insight to things that you didn't even know you were had issues on before. Would you ever create your own insurance company? Like Elon. So Elon, right? So they have all the data with the Teslas. And so super fun. Let's, uh, since we have the data on the driver, let's create an insurance company. Low cost insurance for them because they know if they're safe they drivers. They have the data. Yeah. I mean, right now we're partnering with insurance companies. Yeah. So we've partnered with a few insurance companies to do discounts to our clients, but who knows? Yeah, the interesting thing about the data, it, it, like when I first heard that you, you're collecting all this data, my mind and it really went to when Diego was in the parking industry and they had all this data collected from the cars themselves where the auto manufacturers weren't doing anything with it. They would track, you know, like how long you were parked at one point, like where you traveled to, all that stuff. And then, you know, these secondary businesses came up and, and realized that they could do something with that data. I mean, for, for your data, I'm, the insurance is, is a, a really nice derivative from that. But I'm also thinking like you could, you could then contract with the people who manufacture the safety helmets and gloves and workwear, whatever it might be, to supply these places with things that they might need, job specific. Like, has it crossed your desk at all? Yeah, we've talked about specifically like tool companies, yeah. being able to link a tool to a task and if that tool requires a certification, does that user have the certificate? You know, maybe it's a scissor lift. Mm -hmm. And so like, do they have a certificate to actually be using that piece of equipment and tracking it that way and letting them know it's about to expire? We have that in some capacity now, but the actual linking of a specific, you know, branded tool, we don't have at the moment. Can users upload like OSHA certifications as well? Yeah. Wow, that's yep. great. And what's great is that Let's say they're on my job today and they go to your job tomorrow. All this information travels with them. And so they don't need to put in a phone number. They don't need to put in an email address. They can create just a username. We do ask the foreman put phone numbers in our email so we can contact them. But we're like a field crew worker, just a username. We're not you know, trying to track any of their personal information because that is a problem in the field. Specifically with the union contractors, like they don't want to be tracked. You know, the goal isn't to collect the data and be tracking them. The goal is to make sure they go home safe. But this is an, an added benefit, essentially, that we are able to figure out where the holes are. And they don't have to carry the OSHA card anymore. Yeah. No, and they don't have to run back to the Which is crazy, truck. by the way. The fact that I always had to have something in my back pocket was insanity in case an OSHA inspector showed up. Do you ever see yourself getting back into construction? Like, do you, well, you think you'll miss being a superintendent? Do you think you'll miss being a project executive? Like, what does that look like for you? I definitely miss it. Again, I have this passion for building and problem solving, but I'm still doing that. I'm just doing it in a different capacity. When I was, you know, I was with Joan, and when the pandemic hit, I started building out a field boot camp to train superintendents. And so I wasn't on the job every day, but I think my passion is for helping people and like helping them figure out, like, if I can just help someone problem solve in one day, like, I'm happy. I wanna, I wanna go like in five years. What are, what are you doing, you think, in five years' time? What's going on? We're IPOing, you're, you're selling. Oh, EMOD, EMOD. has taken off. EMOD's everywhere. So my goal is that EMOD is becoming that platform industry-wide yeah. for safety. That, you know, it's the one everyone goes to. Everyone talks about PlanGrid, Procore, Autodesk. They're all great project management solutions, but they're not safety solutions. And so how do we become that known safety solution where I can go from job site to job site and it just comes with me and all my information is there and you know, we can really start using this information to benefit, but also become like an education platform at some capacity. Throughout your entire career, is there like a special story that sticks out to you as to when you had to like do more? Yes. I was working in Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. Okay. Huge, ugly building Massive in building. San Francisco. Yeah, are are you? Some people love it. I'm not sure I do. The biggest project in San Francisco. The biggest project in probably California. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was running three floors and I was supposed to have like my first Saturday off in forever. And I had Lauren, who I call my mini me. I had her watching the job site. There was just a few trades working. I'm like, you know, all you got to do is make sure that no one gets hurt. And, you know, they finish taping this wall. So they go in, they do it. Apparently they had closed down the garage. And all the guys' trucks got stuck in the garage. 
And we had an issue where they couldn't get the trucks out of the garage and it was, you know, everyone was mad and there's just a, a big blowout happening on the job site. And I walked up to the superintendent from another company that was, you know, preventing my guys from leaving and just said, you know, this is what needs to happen. This is like, this isn't fair. You didn't notify X, Y, and Z, whatever the situation was. And he blew up on me. Like he had steam coming out of his ears. He was bright red. He parked his truck across the parking lot. So like he, people physically couldn't get out and just threw a fit. And there's me. I'm tired. I just want to go home. It's a Saturday. And I was like, come on, buddy. We got we to gotta fix this. We're not doing this right now. And I kept my cool the entire time. And Lauren walked up to me after. And I, you know, I'm sitting on the floor on the job site like, oh, thank God it's over. Everyone got home. She's like, I am so proud to work for you. She's like, you kept your cool the entire time. She's like, you showed them who was boss. You did your job. You didn't blow up. You didn't throw a tantrum like they did. And you just did it. And it didn't even phase you. And I feel like I've had people blow up on me before in the past. And my response is always like, do you feel better now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got that out. <laughs> yeah. But having a mentality like that, you know, I didn't want to go on that Saturday. She called me to come help her. And I'm so happy I did because it gave her that confidence the next time, like she had an issue where someone was blowing up on her to just, you keep your cool. Like you don't raise your voice. You don't yell. That's not who you are. You know, you want to be professional and respected and, you know, throwing a tantrum is not going to make you be respected as a superintendent. I think this yeah. is, so this is interesting. So this is uh, it came up on a podcast we did yesterday actually with Stephanie of She Builds. And so she said, cause I was asking her like, I think women care more. And so I think there are a few inherent superpowers women have in construction or anything else. And I think one is caring. And she brought up this one. She's like, the second one is we deal with children and people who make ridiculous requests to us all the time, whether they're hitting on us or whether they're kids or men. And so we're just used to staying in the pocket and watching other humans be crazy. And that makes us (laughs) super well equipped to deal with unruly men. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And they say that women are the more emotional species. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's <laughs> I would judge def- that. It's, I, I mean, working in construction, <laughs> it's definitely not women. <laughs> but there is a, like, a whole side of this where we shouldn't have to deal with that. Right. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Yeah. There should be professionalism on all sides, no matter who you're talking to. Right. Yeah. But part of me feels like the women who are in the field right now have to have big shoulders and they need to take one for the team for the future generations. We were talking earlier about the book Atomic Habits and easy has a cost. You know, by not pushing back, by not saying something, it's not going to change. You know, if we don't push technology, they're not going to adopt technology. If we don't say something, they're going to continue to call us, hey, hon, sweetheart, you know, I've always thrown back, yeah, pumpkin, what do you need? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. So and good. it's just like, that. it's things like that, that if you don't call them out, they may not even recognize that they're doing it. And it may not be intentional, but... Easy has a cost. If we just let it happen, it's going to continue to happen and the industry is not going to change. I know an iron worker that she got completely burnt, burnt out. She's been in the industry for 30 years and she's like, I just couldn't deal with the misogyny anymore. And she just, you know, she said, good luck with your career. And I, I hope that, that things change and that you are experiencing change, but I'm, I can't do it anymore. And I just thought like, what a shame, you know, because we're in this time now where I think things are actually changing and not people aren't just saying they're changing like they are. I am experiencing the change and it's happening and it's wonderful. But I just feel bad for those previous generations of women that went into the field and were just, I mean, treated like horribly. And now they're burnt out and they're turned off from construction forever. And it's just too bad because they're so good at what they do and they just, you know, they don't have the patience for it anymore. But I definitely feel like there's a change happening. The last 10 years have been a huge change. Massive. If you look at like... It's only getting better. Over the last decade, what, from day one for me, what it looked like versus now, it's it's so different. What advice do you guys have for either women today that could be in high school or are considering dabbling into the trades or into getting in construction? What, you know, what's the key piece that you guys have really, like the cornerstone of something you might go back to when things get rough? I mean, I would say don't be intimidated by it because, you know, just because it is a historically male-dominated field, I mean, it is so much fun. 
Like construction is so much fun. Like I'm on the job site every day because I want to be on the job site every day because I'm watching what's happening. It's efficient. It's fun. It's like you're, you're like Kate, every Katie day is said, different. Every day is different. No two days are the same and you're problem solving all day. And it's empowering. It's a hundred percent empowering, you know, and seeing something that you physically had a hand in just go up right in front of you is it's, it's instant gratification. I mean, what could be better than that? And I'd say just do not be intimidated by it. And that I think women are especially good at this, at this industry because we care and because we're always invested in the details and it's personal to us. I agree with you completely. Um, I'd say also say like a diverse team is probably a more functional team. Yeah. You know, they're more successful. Not butting heads. I mean, the whole conversation around like, right now it's women in construction. Like, LGBTQ community, like getting them involved. Like there's going to be so many other issues like moving forward where we're, women's just the first step. Like we need to be more inclusive. We need a more diverse community in general than just women. Everyone I've seen all the, like the women at work signs. It needs to be a human at work. Yeah. Right. People at work. Yeah. Like, and, and to show all genders, all different types of people and not just pink shirts. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) It's no more, offensive. no more pink hard hats. Like, no yeah. more pink shirts. I walk pink into Wake Up and I'm like, "Are you kidding me? No where one's that, actually buying Where did buying that come these. from? Where did the pink hard hat? I oh do them God. as visitors, or visitors. for someone who, okay. um, if you don't bring your hard hat to my job site, you end up in a pink hard hat. That's so funny. So, I oh, that. I like that. Yeah. punishment. A little bit. Wow. I remember I it the tape next day. In pink, so in pink duct tape, so that no one takes them because they won't touch it. But my my tape measures, t- you know, they'll disappear. It happens on job sites. But I'll wrap them in pink duct tape, and no one will touch it. So I know there are some women who love the pink boots, the pink hard hats and whatnot. I associate it with, do you remember back in Boston, the Ask a Pink Hat at the Red Sox games? Oh, God, yes. That's what I associate it with. Oh, I remember that. And so for me, Ask a Pink Hat is like, you don't know anything about the game. You don't know anything about baseball. Yeah. So ask a pink hat on a job site to me, like that's what I correlate yeah. it with. That's so as the only non-Bostonian, former Bostonian <laughs> here, can East you Coaster explain though. to me what ask a pink hat was? <laughs> it was always like women at the Red Sox games that would be wearing these like baby pink hats. So the Red Sox are, you know, like red and blue. The best team ever. Who are the Red Sox? Oh my God. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. He's from Maryland. Just give him a chance. No. Okay. Okay. You know, they became they were, like they iconic the... though. The hat became like a fashion trend, but it was also like kind of jabby it was like meant to get women in baseball in a safe way and it was kind of like yeah. eh. but you understood why they were doing it right. in today's world you it would not exist it would People, never happen they, today. Would, they would boycott no. the whole game yeah but at that time it was like how do we get more women it was all about getting more women fans weird yeah. to think back on actually but like that's what i connect it with and yeah. i just i have a hard that time was cool yeah. But yeah, the, cool. the women on, on our job sites and the women that I see in the field and, and, and most of my, my friends are, are GCs, you know, I've never seen them in that kind of equipment. I have never seen that. It's the same thing that, you know, the guys wear, the same thing we all wear, but I've never seen anyone actually wear it. I would also say women in construction, they're a bunch of badasses. Like they're all, I feel like personality wise, you meet another female in construction and you know. You know, yeah, 100%. and especially if they're passionate That's about a lion. it, they just like you know you're gonna connect with them because they're excited. They have the same passions and like a lot of the same drive and determination to like work through what's out there. I still feel like I have more to prove. Like I have to be the best. Like I have to be because you, you know because as soon as I walk on the site. I think it's it, it just kind of like intrinsic and it's not meant to be malicious. But guys think like, okay, does she know? You know what she's talking about. You got to build their trust. And I have to build it, and I have to be the one to be like to take care of them, to go through things with them, and to help them. And now, like I have subs, you know, subcontractors for those in, that are not in the industry that say to me, "We only want to work for female GCs now because they actually take the time. You guys actually take the time to go through details with us, and you don't just you know brush us off and say like, "Hey, it's in your contract. Figure it out." Like that's not my job. And we actually spend the time and care. And so. I feel like needing to go above and beyond and like be the best is, it's still kind of like a chip. And that's why I think we're, we're also just so good at it. We're constantly you know? trying to prove ourselves yeah. that we belong there. Yeah. You know, like that we belong and on the we job excel. site. We belong. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you want to share about EMOD? Anything else that we may have missed? We are a growing company. We're doing great things. We are, 2022 is our year. This is the year it's going to take off. And, you know, we're traveling to all these conferences. We're going to be all over the country and, you know, if we a lot of speaking paths, panels you're on. Yeah. Yeah. I can't mention one of them yet, but there's a big conference in uh, May <laughs> in San Francisco that we will be uh, on a panel with, which is 
Very exciting. Just real quick, do you ever see a government contract in your future, like maybe partnering up with OSHA to distribute EMOD to every job site? So we've actually met with retired OSHA inspectors and we, we've walked them through it. You know, we want to make sure we want to make sure that we're not just wearing our blinders and that we've built it for one general contract. We want to make sure that like, we are actually hitting the marks. Absolutely. I'd love to, you know, partner with OSHA in some capacity. It's hard. It that is part hard. I imagine is there's difficult. a lot of steps. There's just, a lot of steps. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. also, I mean, frankly, trying to monetize in their own capacity. And so well, a lot of these things, the problem these groups have is like staying relevant mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't give very obvious advantages to, advantages to com companies. And yeah. so they have to stay like Switzerland, but it's also like what makes them disappear. And so getting a team at OSHA to con like commit to a partnership is, I would say, probably not high yield, but Yeah, I would maybe. take an OSHA approval. Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah. software, like right. I would absolutely yeah. love that. OSHA compliant, that it checks all the boxes. Exactly. Our other big thing that I'm really focused on in the future is hiring retired and injured contractors for our deployment team. Oh, nice. That's so super smart. That's And it's just like the sales pitch pro right tip. there. Like, pro tip, pro yeah. tip right there. Yeah, that's I mean, a pro tip. They are a living example Very of what can happen reminder. if you are not thinking about safety 100% on the you job. You know, you have a, like a young tech kid show up on your job site teaching 20 contractors how to use it versus having, you know, someone who got injured on a job site who was in the field for 20 years, mm -hmm. who are you going to listen to? Right. Totally. And it's, again, built for the field, by the field, and that's like really what we want to focus on. I have another question, too, because there's so many other industries that would I think would benefit from this. Like, I mean, we are in Los Angeles. Production, you know, for, for one. I mean, there's so many regulations and rules and people there's tons of people everywhere i mean they definitely have things they have equipment everywhere you know safe paths of, tra of travel you know is needed like ladders the same kind of scaffolding lifts things that we deal with in construction they deal with as well and then you know like are people eating are they drinking water it could be 105 degrees out those things like those checklists and and, and making sure are you guys expanding into other industries like that we have one client right now who's in manufacturing um and i can see us heading that way our Bread and butter is construction. That's what yeah. we know. You want to plant your flag there first. Yeah. yeah. I will say a lot of the processes we're seeing, even in some government entities, are very similar. Obviously, the terminology is all different, but the workflows are exactly the same. And so I think, you know, once we get up off the ground really and hit the ground running, then opportunities will be there. Tell everyone where they can find you, where they yeah. can find EMOD. Well, we're on emodsafety.com. We can follow us uh, on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. And yeah, definitely reach out. Our team's awesome. We're excited. Especially if you are a retired or formerly injured yeah. contractor. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. looking for yeah. a job. Hired. Yeah. <laughs> Katie, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Real thank pleasure you for the show. Yeah, this thank was you. great. This was part one in our four part series highlighting women in construction. We'd like to thank Cat Footwear for helping us to share their stories. I think it's safe to assume that if you've made it this far, you've enjoyed the show. So consider subscribing, or better yet, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It's one of the best and easiest ways you can support us. We are at Startup to Storefront on every social media platform, except for Twitter, where you can find us at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.